Welcome to the With Winning in Mind podcast. I'm Heather Sumlin along with Troy Basham. Today we've decided to think about what are our favorite parts of some of the books that we have. So I'm going to throw it to Troy first. We, we talk a lot about attainment. We did a whole episode on attainment about a year ago. If you haven't seen that, jump back and watch it. But we haven't done anything on Freedom Flight, and that's probably my favorite. Of all of the books, I think it's my favorite to read first. What about you? Really not attainment. Sorry. It does start with an A. <laughs> it it starts with F. an A, so you should read it first. I'm insulted. I apologize, but I absolutely, I love Freedom I think because for me, Freedom Flight has, it's an inspirational, motivational story, and I like that storyline that gets you excited, and it's a good prelude because the story takes place before mental management was created, so it kind of is, a, I think it's a good prelude to the rest of our materials. But it's it's probably the best kept secret of all of them. I would agree. It is a, it is a kept secret. And it is a motivational book. And it's probably the one that, when people read, are impacted immediately. Mm-hmm. The other books, you know, with Winnie Mai being the foundation model management, gets people thinking. Mm-hmm. Attainment gets people realizing, oh, wait a minute. If, if I just did these things, I could reach my potential. And Freedom Flight is that motivational, okay, I have no reason to be upset, to complain, to be down when so many other people have had it worse than I am. So speaking of that, do you want to tackle the... Because there's basically 15 different points that Lanny makes in that book that are very helpful. But there's one I know you like more okay. than any others. Do you want to want to share that? Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just make sure that I do it right. So basically the way the book is set up, for those of you who have not read it, it's really short. It packs a powerful punch. And I like to say it takes away your wine. Like if you're someone who's whining about your circumstance or your situation, um, this book has a unique way of taking that away from you. Like you don't have a reason to whine after you read it, but you're empowered a little bit. You want to go and tackle whatever's going on and make life a little bit better for yourself. But my favorite part, well, there's several favorite parts. Like the very beginning when, um, and we're not going to spoil the story by telling you the story, but... There's a point in the beginning where someone tells our dad, you know, are you in prison or free? That's my favorite. That well, I'm going to let you tackle that, but that's the first favorite, and you're going to tackle that in a minute. But then later on, he talks about how um, – I'm going to make sure that I read it correctly here. Um, it is principle – maybe it's not principle. Was it lesson? Lesson number 11. No matter how bad our environment seems, others have endured more – and complained less. And that always hits me like right here because I start to think about my circumstances and I th- start thinking, yeah, this is so bad and this is so horrible and wah, 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 wine, wine, wine. And then when I really think about it, there's someone probably right across the street or even in my life that has it so, so, so bad, so much worse than me and they don't complain. And they get up every day, and they move forward, and then I'm over here whining. So that one always gets me. So it's probably my favorite. Yeah, it's so easy to complain, I think. I Well, yes, it is. It is. But it's not, it's not valuable. When has complaining ever helped you? It's a temporary feeling that you get of venting, mm-hmm. but it's short-lived. It's not going to solve anything. But we do it because for that moment, it makes us feel good. And we're hoping that somebody else will also jump in and complain. And then later we realize, well, maybe they have it worse than I do, so I'm okay. You know, it's kind of like that direction is kind of how I look at it. When what this is really telling you is what's the point in complaining? You are in the situation you are in. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do about it? I like to I like to think that if you can't change it it doesn't deserve your attention. Like and yet we give things our attention and our time that are unnecessary and this book kind of changes that perspective for people. Yeah, I think a lot of people think their situation is really bad because they're only looking at their situation and not the broader picture mm-hmm. which is we live in a world that Billions of people have lived on this planet over the years and Mm -hmm. billions more in the future. 
And we don't even bother thinking about, well, someone probably had it worse than I do right now. Mm -hmm. And trust me, there are some people that live some lives that were just not even close to the issues that the average person is going to struggle in the world that we live in in today. So people often look at themselves, they look beyond that. But when you're in a position, as this story goes into, where you're in a position that is truly unique, truly bad, Mm -hmm. and the only way you can get out of it is to mentally put yourself in a different place. And that kind of segues into the very first part, or one of the beginning things that Lanny makes a point in here is when he meets the guy. So the story is basically Lanny Basham is on a plane flight talking to a guy that's sitting next to him on a plane, and the guy just asks him a simple question. Mm -hmm. And this is the favorite part for me because it's such a simple question that I think everybody today should ask themselves. Are you in prison or are you free? Not from a physical standpoint, from a mental. You know, are you in prison or are you free of your mind? Are you entrapped in I can't get out of my own way with my Mm -hmm. thoughts? Or are you free in the way that you can move forward and explore opportunities to take advantage of what's in front of you? And this guy explains a true imprisonment. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you what it's like to be in a prison environment. Mm -hmm. You know, you you don't have any freedom. You know, you're stuck in a situation, in a cell, can't go anywhere, so much controlling your time, all that kind of stuff. He goes, but that doesn't mean your mind has to be trapped. That is so cool to me. So when our father was going through the journey of shooting and trying to make his Olympic dream possible and he fails to win the Olympics, and shortly after that he has the experiment experience talking to this individual and the individual is like well are you in prison are you free and he's like well i'm free of course i live in the united states you know i'm shooting i'm doing what i love to do and he goes like, yeah i've been listening to you for like 45 minutes and it doesn't sound that way you've been complaining the whole time you're living in a self-imposed prison yeah so he's just like mentally in prison but he never thought about that and it's like so many people mm-hmm. are in that situation I think it's true, and especially now, I feel like there's so much opportunity. All around, there's so much opportunity. And you can choose to look at adversity as something that holds you back or that actually is an effective and efficient, potentially, teacher to you, to be able to view adversity as a way to learn and to grow and to move forward. It takes discipline, but, man, it can be so freeing. Yeah, and then you segue into your favorite one which is where people are complaining about the situations that they're in, but yet there's so many other people before them that have had it worse but complain less. And you th- you think about certain people that are in a situation that you would never want to be in. Like the hockey player that was on his way to being a superstar and then his first game he has a tragic accident and winds up being paralyzed from the neck down but yet his attitude is amazing it's like how is that possible or a person that is literally put in prison for something they didn't do and went years you know let's say seven years of going through something to where they'll never get that seven years in their life and they come back but they're thankful for just being home Mm mm-hmm they don't complain about the seven years. They're like, can't do anything about it. I'm just happy I'm home. I'm happy my reputation's restored. I can't wait to move forward. Yeah. It's not what most people do. Most people, I'm as guilty as everybody else. <laughs> I complain every now and again. He does. Only, <laughs> so do I. I mean, I think everybody does. I only complain when I hang around Lucas and Heather. That's all. Right. Yeah, that's it. That's the only time, for sure. Only. But, but I think you have to limit who you complain to. I think, and we've talked about this before, is I think it's okay to vent, but I I feel like you should vent to one person who can actually help you either find the solution to the problem or refocus your thought process. Because if you're venting and just pulling up everybody in your, gosh, old school term Rolodex, right? And you're calling everybody to tell them about how horribly you've been wronged or whatever's going on, 
all that is doing is it winds up making you more and more of a complainer or more and more likely that you're only going to see the glass half full. And so half full, no, half empty, which is right. You want to think of it as being half full. Hmm. If you're venting, that would be a half. Actually, I want to think of it as completely full. But if it's actually half full, then. But what you're hitting on is really the second part of a three-step process. Enlightenment. If you, if you truly need to vent. So growing up, one of the things mm-hmm. that our father told us that was pretty interesting that rarely did I think any of us do. But he said, look, if you've got to really vent and get something off your chest, then it's simple. You do it on Sunday night yep. at 9 o'clock in the bathroom. And then you just vent away. Scream if you want, yell if you want, just get it out. Because by Sunday night, you'll forget what you were frustrated about. <laughs> so if you forgot to vent on Sunday night, it wasn't worth expressing. Yeah. Two, if you do, and you do do that, then you're in an environment where no one else is around, Mm -hmm. and they don't need to hear it. And then after you're done, you'll probably realize, yeah, a lot of what I just said really is kind of silly. It's kind of dumb. And then you realize, again, not really worth venting out. But what if you're like, I'm glad I did that, but I seriously have an issue, I need to find a solution to this, mm-hmm. then you go to step two, which right. is what you're hitting on that I think is real important is until you have that realization that this is worth me going to somebody and saying, I just got to get this off my chest and I don't know what to do. Or I need help with moving forward. Have to go to that one person who's the best person that can help you with that because many people go to the wrong person. Like go to the best friend or they go to their you know, closest person right at that time. Who doesn't want to hear anything. Or just wants to ramp you up because they feel the same way. And then you're on this battle to see who can complain the most. Yeah, don't come into your problems. I got too many problems. But that's who we wind up going to. But if you have to think about it, hmm, who's the person I can go to? Then what happens is that venting potential turns into a solution discussion to put you on the right path, which leads you to the third part, Mm -hmm. which is actually moving towards that path. Because now I'm moving towards becoming someone that's better rather than being a victim of this thing I'm complaining about. I like it. Like, I also think that's why mentorship is so important. There's a big difference between a friend and a mentor. Like, a mentor, I feel like, is someone who purposefully is investing in you to help guide you to where you need to go because they've been there. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of finding those people in your life that can intentionally pour into you, and then you find people you can intentionally pour into as well. Yeah, that's a good point. So in your personal example, mm-hmm. worked with a lot of people over the years, mm-hmm. been around the block, seen a lot of things. So is there a personal example or an example of someone that you could mm-hmm. share that hits this point of people have gone through more, but complain less there was a client that I had several years ago and and since I haven't asked her if I can share her story I I won't say her name but she might be someone we should interview now that I'm thinking about it but she had lost both of her parents Um, she had been homeless she had tremendous struggle in her life like she lost both of her parents as a teenager so it wasn't like you know um, in some in just kind of suddenly and all of the, all of this adversity it was like one thing after another, yet probably one of the most positive and optimistic people that I've met as a young adult. Just so positive and so certain that everything's going to work out, and truly embrace the idea that I'm here for a reason, and God's going to use me in whatever way He needs to. And while all this horrible thing has happened to me. That doesn't need to define me. And so that's an example of someone who actually followed some of the things that are talked about in this book without even realizing it. And um, just an incredible human. And so I think it's when I'm working with people like that that they've endured these amazing trials and struggles way beyond anything that I've ever endured 
that it puts into perspective that, man, my life, I've been pretty blessed and I need to be thankful and grateful for those blessings and those gifts that I've been given and not waste a day. Yeah, so what is your favorite movie that presents that? Oh, my goodness. There's so many. You can put me on the spot about movies. Um, You have one in mind. That's why you asked me that question. Yeah. Because you always do that. You ask me a question (laughs) when you have an answer. I have one. It's fictional. I don't think it's. I don't think it's accurate. I don't know if it was inspired by true events, but well, we, one of my all-time favorites is a, okay. is a struggle. And at the very end, the guy all he wanted to do was get out. And then the last ending, the last picture you get is you just see. You can just see the guy's just forward thinking. Okay. He's not thinking of the past at all, and that Shawshank Redemption. I knew that's where you were going to go because you've talked about that movie before. And then I thought, I thought about um, Pursuit of Happiness because we talked mm-hmm. about that one before too. I like all the feel good movies. I love overcoming type movies. I love movies based on a true story where people overcome the odds, and I love that kind of stuff. Yeah, and it really helps you think about these people endured all this stuff, and I haven't come close to that. Ooh. Do me a favor. If you're watching this, post like your favorite overcomer story or story that highlights how someone handled adversity really well so that we can watch all those movies. Yeah, the, the most popular one probably is Rocky. Oh, okay. I could see that. The most common one that comes up. Maybe. I think it would be that one. But I'm curious to see what those who are watching this episode want. Think it's true. Think it's the best movie. That should be a movie. Freedom Fly should be a movie. It's a really cool story. It's kind of, um, it's inspired by true events. It's not necessarily 100% accurate. What happens in the story isn't necessarily the story that was told to our father on the plane. But the person that our father met completely changed his life and his perspective, which I think is powerful. Yeah, the character that plays the person that he talked to is really a cook climber. He says three people. It's mm-hmm. really four people. So the first person is the individual. Mm-hmm. You know, right. Jack was an, an actual person who mm-hmm. went through some of the stuff that's in the book. Right. The The second one is, of course, our father's father, our grandfather, who instilled some key principles and a way of looking at things differently. Mm-hmm. You know, like one of the most impactful things that I thought our grandfather did when our dad was shooting at the very beginning Mm -hmm. and he didn't know anything about international or competitive shooting Mm -hmm. because he was in the infantry. So it's like, look, I know how to shoot a rifle (laughs) when trying to go to battle, but it's different when you're trying to compete, right? right? And he made the comment, there's probably a million ways to do it wrong. There's probably one or two ways to do it right. Let's let's focus on finding those one or two ways and only Mm -hmm. repeat that. I thought that was kind of brilliant. It's genius because why would we focus on all the thousands of ways to do something wrong? (laughs) Let's simplify this. So you have a little of that in this character. And then you have Bill Pullum, Mm -hmm. who is our dad's coach when he was at the Army. You know, and Bill Pullum wasn't – he wasn't like a competitive rifle shooter that became a coach. But he was brilliant in helping people reach their potential – by pushing them, motivating them, and giving them direction that was truly in their benefit. So one of the the best things, it's not in this book, but it'll give you an idea of who Pullum was, an individual, and this part of who he was, personality-wise, comes across in this character in the movie. And that is when, when Dad talks about, <laughs> he talks about the um, Captain Superstar story do you remember that Captain superstar i yeah. feel like i missed out on a lot of dad stories He's, or maybe it was a lieutenant superstar it was well, lieutenant maybe superstar it's are these stories that happened up at the range when y'all were like shooting and practicing? No, this one this one was when when dad was in the army marksmanship unit he first gets there bill oh. pullum tells mm-hmm. him he said look go to point 15 and dry fire standing and so dad does that mm-hmm. and about an hour and a half goes by and He's like, well, what am I supposed to do? So he goes in the office. He goes, hey, I just spent an hour and a half dry firing, standing. What, what do you want me to do next? He goes, if I want you to do something different, I'll come tell you. Ooh. So what happened is at the, the end of the week, they leave to go to a match. But Landy's there by himself because he's not on the team yet. You have to earn. right? So he's sitting there dry firing, standing for like two weeks 
on point 15. When he comes back, then Pullum comes and says, okay, now do this. And so he just thought it was really odd. Why would he make me do this? Mm -hmm. Well, fast forward a year or two goes by, and here comes Lieutenant Superstar. Because the the people that get recruited into the Army Marksman Unit, they have to meet a certain requirement. Most of them have to be collegiate All-Americans or national champions. I mean, these are people who already probably have an ego. They're already good. And this guy was no exception. He had an ego. And he came in, and, of course, Boom said go to – point 15 and dry fire standing so he goes there about an hour later he comes back he goes you know i didn't come here to dry fire Ooh. and he goes next thing you know lieutenant <laughs> superstar is back in his bags and gone <laughs> he is out of there and so you see a little bit about that kind of character where here's a person mm-hmm. that look i know what's best for you you might not know what's best for you but mm-hmm. i do and if you're not going to listen i don't have time for you yeah i had so never have, heard that captain superstar yeah story. so you have a little bit of that and then the fourth thing that lanny never shares with people is the there's a a combination the experiences this guy goes through is a combination of experiences that our father heard about and read about about people who went through some very Similar. dramatic mm-hmm. prisoner of war type experiences. Mm-hmm. So he, he takes some of those and he says, okay, what if I create an, an element where I know this happened to this person, but I kind of want it to transfer to this. So mm-hmm. he kind of takes a little liberty to make that. So, you know, when people say, well, was this person in this situation or that situation? It's like, yes, some of that is true, but in other areas, it wasn't him. It was someone else Mm -hmm. that was in that situation during this time period of about seven years, I think. And so when you take all that, you're like, yeah. And really, when you look at it, it sounds really impressive what the guy does, but it's not even close to what some of the real stories you would hear Mm -hmm. from other people that would accomplish. He just kind of made it fun because it really hit the home point of what he wanted. And it's hard to do if you don't take some liberty to explain some things. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I love Seabiscuit. I watched that movie, but do you, I honestly think that it happened the way the movie said it happened the way it happened? No, there's certain things in the movie that I think are probably really good that may have totally be fiction, but it illustrates and highlights the main point that really happened. So I run with it. The main core is what's what's valid in here, and that's what's it's, important. To me, it's the lessons within the story, that that's what matters most because there are lessons you can apply to anybody in any circumstance. It's not specific to sport. It's certainly not specific to shooting. Um, and it's also my favorite product of ours for a teenager to read. Um, Number one is it is a story. Number two, it's short. So they have the time and they have the ability to actually get through it. You can get through it in one setting. I have yet to have one of my younger clients read it and not love it. And then they come back and it's highlighted and they've written notes in the margin. And when you can get someone who's a teenager to have that kind of response to a book that they've read, to me that's that's a big deal. So parents, if you have a teenager that whines and complains for Christmas. And if you want to be motivated, if you're struggling, like I cannot get going Mm -hmm. with something, you know, you feel kind of down the dumps. That is a story that would really help you get that initial boost to get out of your chair and say, okay, there's no reason for me to be having a pity party. I can be in in a better situation if I put my mind right and ask yourself, are you in prison or are you free mentally? Are you complaining about a situation that other people have probably had worse situations, but don't complain much about it, and then move on from there? I love it. If you don't have a copy of Freedom Flight, you can grab one at Amazon. You can find it on our website, mentalmanagement.com. Pick up a couple of the other books while you're there. Join our Patreon channel. Troy and I are going to dive into some deeper concepts to be able to help our Patreon members more. There'll be a link in the description here. Have a great, blessed rest of your day.